Deep inside each of us is a longing, a yearning for greatness. We want to know the world is different because we have lived. We want to make our mark. We want to be remembered for something beyond average, something great. But how do we get there? In this practical and inspiring series, we'll encourage you to take the next step on your journey towards a full, abundant life. We'll help you get connected to others, to God, and to your greater purpose through service. You can be great. You can matter. You can find the purpose and significance you are longing for. Join us for this four week series on the greatness principle. Last spring, when my friend Carl was at the end of his battle with cancer, the day came when he made the decision to discontinue the treatment. It was his second go around with cancer and he was tired. The disease had taken a toll on him and he said, I'm done, no more tubes. I went to see him in the hospital and it was there when they removed the tubes and Carl looked better than he had in months. It was like, a small miracle. He sat up. He said he wanted an a and root beer float. It was his favorite treat and one that he had been denied for quite a while. So I made a mad dash to a and and I brought back some floats for all of us and we all enjoyed that sweet treat together. I'll never forget the look in Carl's face when he took that first slow bite, savoring it. And Carl said, thank you, God. My name is Kathy Doby. I'm a partner at Sycamore Creek Church and a volunteer on the teaching, vision, and worship teams. We are in the midst of a series called The Greatness Principle, based on this little book by Nelson Searcy with Jennifer Dykes Henson, called The Greatness Principle, Finding Significance and Joy by Serving Others. The book looks deceptively simple and small, but the lessons it holds are powerful. We've been looking at what makes a great life, what it takes to move from mediocre to exceptional. And we all desire to do things that really matter. It's not just about being successful in life. Success is only one part of the equation of what constitutes an exceptional life. We're talking about significance. We long to be significant, to have a life with purpose and to make an impact, to make a real difference while we're here. Greatness principle can be summed up pretty neatly. I mean, simply this, when you bless others, God blesses you. Greatness is not coincidental, it's not happenstance or just luck. It is the disciplined and intentional practice of one key personal principle. That's positive expectation. Positive expectation is discovered when we become more observant of life, more conscientious of opportunities. If we're not observant, we're not taking notice, we'll miss opportunities to bless others. It's more than positive thinking. It's positive believing. And today, I want to talk about positive expectation and having a heart of greatness. Theologian John Calvin said, however many blessings we expect from God, his infinite liberality will always exceed all our wishes and our thoughts. I like how Paul put it better in his letter to the Ephesians you re may remember these words from a series we did back, a while back at Sycamore Creek called God is Able. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. God is able to do infinitely, exceedingly, abundantly more than we might ask or think. 
And when our positive expectation is based on this truth, it wields a lot of power. Learning to implement positive expectation into our thought process has a potential to transform our lives and the lives of those around us. It's being observant and consciously, intentionally looking for the positive and opportunities where you can bless others. If you're looking for the negative, you'll find that too. This is a, a good place for us to pause and connect with someone nearby and, and, and share a chat question. I wonder, when was a time that you intentionally did something that you knew would be a blessing for someone? And how did doing that make you feel? Let's take a few minutes and talk about that. Biblical positive expectation based on God's ability to work in our lives. Is that the same as the popular positive thinking techniques that permeate pop psychology today, all those bestsellers on Oprah's book club list? Those books are entertaining, but I'm talking about true positive expectation that can only be realized as we discover God's word in the best-selling book of all time and how God wants to bless us as we actively believe what God says. Let's start by defining positive expectation. What, what is it exactly? Well, positive expectation is the state of knowing that you are partnering with God to do God's work in the world and believing that God will be true to his promise to bless you in return. It's knowing and believing. Now, I know this sounds a little like blessing based on our doing good work, but it's really about obedience. It's about trusting God and surrendering to God's will so that we might really begin to think and act like Jesus. And many people wish for God's blessings, but don't really want to do the work of surrendering completely to God's will. We will never experience true positive expectation by wishful thinking. That's, that's like hoping for a genie in a bottle. In order to walk with God, to experience God's goodness and blessing, we must humble and commit ourselves and honor God with our service. When we do that, God will honor us in return. Jesus made that promise himself. He said, anyone who wants to be my disciple must follow me. My servants must be where I am. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Jesus' implication here is that when we follow him and begin to think and act and serve like Jesus, God will honor us for serving. That is the greatness principle. When you bless others, God blesses you. Now, there are two key factors that are necessary in order to incorporate positive expectation in our lives. Two things needed to live out the greatness principle. First, to expect God's blessing. And second, to recognize God's blessing. Expect and recognize. Now, you may feel uncomfortable expecting God to bless you, but positive expectation is rooted in believing God's word. It is believing that God will do what God said he would do. It is, first of all, expecting God's blessing. The greatness principle has been referred to as an if-then statement. It's what we call a conditional statement with a hypothesis followed by a conclusion. If this happens, then that will happen. If you bless others, then God will bless you. If then. The terminology is rooted in the computer programming world, but it's actually quite ancient. It goes all the way back to Genesis, the first book of the Bible. God said in Genesis 18, 26, if I find 50 righteous people in Sodom, I will spare the city for their sake. If then. And in Isaiah 1, 19, God said, if 
you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. And in 1 John, verse 1, 9, John wrote, But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If, then. We use if, then all the time on our loved ones, don't we? And we would tell our spouse, if you make dinner, then I will do the dishes. Or we might tell a child, if you clean up your room, then maybe we'll go for ice cream. I use these conditional statements on my brother all the time growing up. If you don't knock it off, then I'm going to tell mom. Nobody wants that to happen. The Bible is full of these if-then conditional statements, and God's word promises time and time again that if you will bless others, then God will bless you. Here are a couple of those promises. First from Matthew 5, 7. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Show mercy, receive mercy. That's, that's love in action. And from Proverbs eleven twenty five, 25, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will be refreshed themselves. Now, even though the Bible assures us of God's blessing, we may still feel awkward about expecting it because, well, probably because we've been conditioned to believe that we should give without expecting something in return. But it is believing and trusting that God will do what God promises to do. If God leads us to opportunities to serve and we respond with positive expectation, that is a demonstration of faith. And there is a potential cost to not believing God's promise to bless. If we don't look for God's blessing, we will miss God's blessing. We, we will fail to give God the glory for the blessing. In order for God to use you in blessing others, your heart must be aligned with God's. That is your part of the bargain. For God to execute the then part of the if-then statement, there has to be an if. If you don't have the if, then you won't get a then. See what I did there? If, then. You have to have the if first in order for the then to happen. Of course, our motivation should never be, what's in it for me? How can I benefit from this situation? Our first thought should be, how can I help? Expecting God's blessing just sweetens the process and puts you in true partnership with God and God's plan to use you to bless others. Once you start practicing positive expectation, you will begin to naturally be on the lookout for God's blessing, for those opportunities where God is at work and to join God in that work. When you know to look for something, you start to see it. You begin to recognize when it shows up. Then you have the opportunity to thank God for his blessing and turn the attention back to God. This is critical to give credit where credit is due. Remember the verse we read earlier from Ephesians? Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Give God the glory. In order to incorporate positive expectation, we need to first expect God's blessing. And then the second key factor, no less important, is to recognize God's blessing. There's an old legend, it's been told and retold, and probably retold, about a young man from a famous family who was about to graduate from high school. And it was a custom in, in this affluent neighborhood for the parents to give the graduate a brand new car. Charlie and his father had spent months looking at cars, and, and the week before graduation, they found the perfect car. But on the eve of his graduation, his father handed him a gift-wrapped Bible. Charlie was so angry that he 
threw the Bible down and stormed out of the house. He and his father never saw or spoke to each other again. It was the news of his father's death that brought Charlie home again. And as he sat one night going through his father's possessions that he was about to inherit, he stumbled across that Bible that his father had given him. Brushing the dust away, Charlie opened it to find a cashier's check dated the day of his graduation in the exact amount of the car that they had chosen together. Now, this is kind of a corny, unbelievable tale, but we get the point. We're not unlike Charlie because we often miss the gifts our Heavenly Father gives us because they're not packaged in the way we thought they should be or the way we wanted them to be. Charlie was expecting a blessing, but he wasn't able to recognize it when it was right in his hands because he had so clearly etched out in his mind what the blessing would look like. He ungratefully tossed it aside. We do this to ourselves when we build something up in our mind right down to the last detail, and then we're disappointed when our expectations are not met. It kind of reminds me of a scene from my all-time favorite movie, the old classic, some of you remember. It's a Wonderful Life. Jimmy Stewart's character, George Bailey, sits at the bar devastated and broken over the misplacement of $8,000 from his Bailey Building and Loan Company. It might as well have been a million. His life is in ruins. He sees no way out. Bank examiners at the door, Mr. Potter's threatening to call the police. In desperation, George, who has spent his whole life doing good, sacrificing for others, serving others, he cries out to God under his breath, God, dear Father in heaven, I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there and you can hear me, show me the way. I'm at the end of my rope. Show me the way, oh God. Moments after George utters that prayer, an angry man sitting next to him at the bar discovers George's identity and angry with him for an earlier incident in the movie, pops George one in the mouth, sending him sprawling and bloodying his lip. George's response, that's what we get for praying. That's what we get for praying. George was hoping for a blessing. Maybe he was expecting one, but he didn't expect a fat lip. And he certainly did not recognize it as a blessing. But spoiler alert, that altercation was the beginning of God's transforming work in George's life. Now, I'm not saying that God caused this man to punch George in the mouth. Only that God's gifts manifest themselves in our lives in many forms. And God can use all of it. He can use all of our circumstances, the good, the bad, and the ugly, to bless us so that we might bless others. So that we need to be aware so that we can be ready to recognize a blessing and acknowledge God as a source to give God the credit. There are four types of blessings I want to highlight. The first is tangible. Second is intangible. The third is greater influence. And the fourth, visible miracles. First, let's talk about tangible blessings. Those are things we can see and touch. Tangible blessings are perhaps the most obvious. It's usually a financial blessing, such as an increase in pay or an unanticipated check in the mail. It's when a material need is unexpectedly met, free meal or clothing. That's the kind George Bailey was hoping for. Something you can see and touch. We hear and read about these tangible blessings all the time, about how someone has a need and out of the blue, often anonymously, they received the exact amount they needed. It's the basis of many of the chicken soup for the soul stories. Listen, you cannot outgive God. Again, we do not give to receive. We do, we do know that if we give with the right heart, God is going to bless you somehow in return. The second type of blessing I want to talk about is intangible. Sometimes Sometimes God fills our lives with intangible blessings. We should live in positive expectation of them 
and be quick to embrace each one that comes our way. Intangible blessings are things like love, good health, sound mind, and a sense of purpose. It's our friendships and just having a good laugh. God's presence in our life, peace and comfort. The, the list is endless. We cannot necessarily see or touch intangible blessings, but boy, we can feel them. They may not always be as fun and as exciting as tangible blessings, but they are the ones that lead us to true joy. Have you ever noticed how serving someone makes you feel so good? That's an intangible blessing. And it's how God blesses George Bailey in the end of the It's a Wonderful Life movie. God gave us this innate sense of fulfillment from being a servant. It's etched in our hearts. And there's nothing more meaningful or significant than knowing that you are partnering with God in doing his good work. We discussed earlier how it feels to help someone out. I'd like to stop here and give you another opportunity to, to have a conversation with someone near you or next to you and discuss this chat question. In what ways have you experienced a tangible blessing or an intangible blessing from helping someone else out? Remember, tangible blessing is one you can see and touch. An intangible blessing is something you feel. Take a few minutes and talk about it. The third type of blessing is greater influence. As followers of Christ, we're already favored and have influence. We're called to shine in a way that it reflects God's glory. We, say, we see that in this verse from Matthew where Jesus tells his followers this, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. As Christ's followers, we are positioned and commanded to bring God's light into a dark world. I'm afraid that sometimes I contribute to the darkness due to my lack of obedience or mistrust of God to do what God promises. God wants us, he wants to use us to influence the world and point others back toward the truth. And when you serve God well, you will be blessed with greater influence. The more you shine your light, the more occasions God will give you to shine. Now the fourth type of blessing is visible miracles. Visible miracles are incredible blessings. Sometimes they're small. Thank you, Jesus, for helping me find my car keys. Or thank you, Lord, for keeping that deer on the side of the road. I pray a lot in my car. Sometimes the visible miracles are distant, like giving money to a ministry in another state or country. Uh, through your partnership with Sycamore Creek Church, we support Dr. Mears food program, which is a program that feeds hungry children in Nicaragua. That is both a tangible and a visible miracle. And when you see visi visible miracles, it's a privilege to witness how your partnering with God accomplishes his purposes in the world. Sometimes it, it takes very little effort on our part to make a big difference. These small victories are often the big victories and the chance for God to work through you. You know, people never forget an act of kindness in a time of need. That can be a miracle. Just having coffee with a friend who's struggling can be a visible miracle. Cheering someone up with your encouraging words can be a miracle. Taking someone a meal, send, sending a card, making a call, they can all be visible miracles. Even bringing someone a root beer float can be a small miracle. 
that visible blessing to Carl was not the kind of miracle that was going to save his life. It didn't change his circumstances or make the disease go away. Carl died not many days after that, but the blessing for him and for me was found in that miracle in that moment when, when he had the health to enjoy that root beer float and say, thank you, God. As you bless others, God blesses you. And when you receive that blessing and thank God for it, you are drawn closer to God. And as a result, you serve him even more and he blesses you at a higher level. It's an upward spiral of meaning and purpose and significance. You will live a life of greatness, not because you are great, though some of you are pretty great, but because God is good and faithful. It's about servanthood, and at the heart of servanthood is love. Love is central to our ability to authentically and continuously live by the greatness principle. This is the heart of greatness when love is at the core of authentic service. Love God, love people. And when we love God, we want to serve him by loving and blessing others. The ability to love our neighbor is revealed through our obedience to God. Who is our neighbor, you might ask? Well, in the well-known parable of the Good Samaritan found in the Gospel of Luke, a man asked Jesus that very question after Jesus told him the two most important commandments were to love God and love others, love your neighbor. Who is our neighbor? Jesus tells him the story of an injured Jewish man lying by the side of the road. He'd been attacked and left for dead. Two different religious leaders, a priest and a temple leader, passed him by. They didn't have the time or desire to get involved. They saw the need. They knew what they should do. But looking out for their own interest, they withheld help for this when desperately needing it. Then along came the Samaritan man, a sworn enemy to the Jews. To, to better understand the depth of the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans, we need only consider the war raging now in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The Good Samaritan had compassion. He took the time and the risk to help. He saw the need, he knew what he should do, and putting his own interests, convenience, and safety aside, he did what he knew he should. Jesus used this example to remind us that we are to serve where there is need. The Samaritan showed mercy, though he was not a friend. He was still a neighbor. Mercy is love in action. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave us some good perspective on this story of the Good Samaritan. He said, I imagine that the first question the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But by the very nature of his concern, the Good Samaritan reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? Who's your neighbor? Your neighbor is someone who has a need that you can fill. In the book, The Greatness Principle, author Nelson Searcy defines it this way. He wrote, your neighbor is anyone God puts in front of you with an immediate need or anyone he guides you to bless on a larger scale. Mercy is literally love in action, seeing a need and knowing what you should do is one thing, but it is meaningless unless you take the next step and actually do it. Now, we may not come across someone lying on the side of the road every day, but we do have daily contact with people who we are called to love. That could be our family, the people we live with. Of course, we may love our family, but how well are we showing them real love and mercy? Our neighbor might be our friends, our church, family, our community. At Sycamore Creek Church, there are any number of ways you can serve. Through the series, we've been um, highlighting the Sycamore Creek Church Serve Sheet. This is a sheet 
that has a way, it summarizes some of the ways that you can serve others through Sycamore Creek Church. And we've been encouraging people to look the serve sheet over each week and to find at least one area in which you might serve. And if you're already serving, thank you. Mark that on the sheet too so that we can acknowledge it. But maybe there is a new opportunity that might interest you. Is there someone or something God is leading you to? We truly live out the greatness principle when we bless and serve and love others. I want to leave you with the words of Mother Teresa, who knew a little bit about serving and being a blessing. She said this, We cannot all do great things, but we can do small things with great love.